I appreciate very much the invitation to come back and be with you again, to see you again. But I will tell you, I really appreciate your willingness to study the Holy Spirit. There's no doubt that uh, it is, through many, a very difficult subject. I think maybe partly it's a difficult subject because we do not pl apply the same kind of good study habits to the Holy Spirit passages that we do in other areas. I think we know we've learned how to be good students. We've learned how to be good Bible students. But sometimes when it comes to the area of the Holy Spirit, it seems to me people kind of set aside some of their good Bible habits and they begin to listen to what others have said and what others have taught. They sometimes begin to rely more on the opinions of others. It is a difficult area, and I will tell you, as Robert was mentioning this morning, uh, there was a time in my life I wasn't sure whether we should try to study the Holy Spirit. Uh, the views on this subject differ widely. Some people hold their views very, very strongly. And I wondered, if we study it, are we going to be coming closer together, or will it study the Holy Spirit? Will it draw us further apart? But finally, as I listened to the things people were saying, I decided we cannot set this subject aside. If we don't study it and understand what the scriptures say, then we perhaps will drift in some of the ideas of others, perhaps denominational ideas. And I believe that we have done that. Because of the controversy in this area, I think some people say, well, this is just a subject I can't understand. If these scholars are looking at it, well, you know, in this university or that university or this denomination or that, if it's that difficult, there's no hope for me. That's not true. You know, that's what many people say about the plan of salvation. They look at the different religious groups and one teaches one thing, one teaches something else. They kind of want to throw up their hands and say, well, I guess we just can't understand it. What an insult to God to suggest that he has given us a book that we cannot understand. We can understand God's plan for man's salvation. We can understand how to worship him on the first day of the week. And I believe that we can understand these passages in the Bible that relate to the Holy Spirit. If we can do objective study, then any study that we have together of the scriptures should bring us closer together. As each of us studies and understands more and, and comes closer to the truth in our understanding, as each of us approaches the truth, that should bring us closer together. Uh, one objective for this series of lessons is to try to remind us how to be good Bible students. Uh, maybe if after I leave, maybe if you don't agree with some of the things that I've suggested that might be possibilities about the Holy Spirit, maybe in spite of that, maybe, maybe you will be more interested. Maybe you'll feel better equipped to study the Bible. Let me tell you that my approach is not to quote men. It's not to quote man-made descriptors. I have heard discussions, I've heard debates on the Holy Spirit where a significant amount of the time was spent trying to decide whether bro, brother so-and-so, long since deceased, what view he held on the Holy Spirit. I don't intend to spend time doing that. I plan to stay away from man-made descriptors. Someone presents a lesson on the Holy Spirit and they talk about the supraliterary indwelling. They talk about non-miraculous uh, supernatural events. I'm not sure what some of those terms mean. They may know what they mean when they say that, but I'm pretty sure that everybody in the audience doesn't have the same understanding that they do. Sometimes the man-made descriptors are what causes the problem, what causes the confusion. Why don't we just stick to the language that's in the Bible? Look at the way the Bible describes things, because there we can study and we can understand what that phrase means, if we're willing to spend the time to see how that phrase is used in other places in the scriptures. And we don't want to devise new doctrines from difficult passages. Really, I think this has been, I think this has been central in some of the views that have been developed about Holy Spirit passages. There is a particular phrase that, that looks interesting. It perhaps looks confusing. And someone will say, well, I think it means this. I think it means that. And in the end, they may wind up holding a view about the Holy Spirit based on that passage that's really inconsistent, inconsistent with other passages. So we don't want to take a difficult passage and devise some view that's not scriptural. We want to make sure we continue to make connections. Several months ago, I, I, I taught a course on how to study. Well, I thought I knew how to study. I've studied the Bible for a while. I've had some academic courses. How would you explain to somebody else how to study? In the end, I decided the best way was studying is making connections. 
It's not just reading. It's not just memorizing. Studying is an active process by which when I read something, I make connections. Oh, this reminds me of this passage over here. Oh, this is like this particular topic that's taught over here. Making connections. We want to do that with respect to these Holy Spirit passages. We want to connect it with other passages, clearer passages. We do not want to come to an understanding of this passage that is inconsistent with, that is even contradictory with other very clear passages. Uh, the approach in the study is to apply good Bible study methods. I hope that some of the things I suggest will be useful to you in many areas of your Bible study. And we want to let the context guide our understanding of a passage. We don't want to come to a passage and say, well, what do you think this means? What do you think this means? If it's a statement by the Apostle Peter, let's see how else the Apostle Peter used that word or that phrase. What we would like to do is let the scriptures interpret the scripture. Study the scripture to understand how the, those particular words or phrases are used in the scriptures. The objective of this study is not to defend one of the popular positions. Um, in fact, in the end, I don't think you're going to say, well, Stan belongs in this camp or Stan belongs in that camp or this camp. I, I'm not trying to support the view of any particular camp about the Holy Spirit or some kind of indwelling of the Holy Spirit. I'm trying just to study the passage and understand what it means. And I'm certainly not trying to impose my views on you. In some cases, I believe that many people have heard only one view of a passage. And in this, there may be several times that I suggest to you a view that's different than the view that you've heard before, different than the, the view that you believed. And I understand sometimes that's painful. I've been in the audience when somebody was saying something that was new and different, or maybe that I thought wasn't right. It's a, it's a painful feeling. If you feel that pain, keep this one thing in mind. I plan to be on a plane Thursday morning. <laughs> You're going to get rid of me. <laughs> so, but for these few days, please at least consider the possibility that some of these different things that I suggest, maybe, maybe they just might be true. I'm not here to impose my views on you. I'm here to suggest to you an alternative way to, in, to view some of these passages. I do want to stimulate deeper study of the scriptures. I want to suggest to you some principles for better study. And I want to show you some alternate interpretations of some of these, quote, Holy Spirit passages. If you have the view that you've seen in the past, if I present something that's different to you, then you have both views in front of you. You can make an informed choice. I really believe that some people today are forming their views on some Holy Spirit passages because that's all they've heard. They really do not know that there is another way to view those passages. Hopefully, maybe I can present some of those other views, and then you, in your study, can make that informed choice. The things we want to talk about in this lesson this morning, there are some key issues in translation. Some of us think it would have been nice if, if, if the Bible had been written in English. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't. And we have to just face up to the fact that we're reading a translation. Uh, to understand what the original text said, sometimes it requires a little bit of effort. But don't we do that in other academic subjects? Is the Bible not worth that same kind of academic effort to understand what was really said in that original language? We need to learn to interpret their words and their phrases and their context. People can take a phrase, an expression, a whole verse, and you take a verse out of context, you can make of it pretty much what you want to. I guess the old expression is a, a text out of its context can become a pretext for anything you want it to mean. We want to take some of these passages that have been given different interpretations and we want to put them back in their context. What is the context? What is being discussed? I think it will give us great insights into what they really mean. Consider who is speaking. Consider who is being spoken to. Well, this is fundamental to understanding any text, any book that you read. We just want to make sure we do those things also when it comes to the passages about the Holy Spirit. Consider how the original audience would have understood the meaning. We are so blessed to have the Bible. But remember, some of those letters were first written to someone else. We need to consider how they would have understood it. And I'll say more about that in a minute. First, key issues in translation. There are two key issues that I want to discuss. One is about capital letters. And I'll explain this in a minute. Sometimes when people see capital letters in our English Bible, 
they assume that they're capitals because they were capitals in the Greek text. We need to talk about that. But it's not just the supplying of capital letters sometimes that creates confusion. It's the supplying also of, of text. Sometimes little words are added, little words that make a very, very big difference. So first about the capital letters. Now several times during this series, there are going to be issues that are a little bit more technical, a little bit more academic. So I've called this my Holy Spirit reference source book. Sometimes we sort of need to take a break, go look at an academic issue, hopefully learn something, and then come back and apply it to our main topic. So the supplied capital letters. Greek manuscripts do not have capital letters. They don't have capital letters at the beginning of sentences. They don't have capital letters on proper nouns. I've given you an example here of a 5th century Greek text of John chapter 1. Now, it's just a lot of Greek letters. <laughs> they don't even have spaces between words. In fact, in this case, the last word on the first line and the first couple of words on the second line are all a part of the same words. They don't even end a word. They just keep going with the string of letters. And the later Greek manuscripts were all lowercase letters. They're either all uppercase or they're all lowercase. What does that mean? That means they don't have capital letters to help us find the beginning of sentences. And they don't have capital letters to help us identify proper nouns, those things that are names. Well, sometimes this becomes a problem in translation. Let me give you an example. And sometimes it's difficult to know whether to treat a word as a proper noun or just to treat it as the meaning that that particular word has. For example, in 2 John chapter 1, there is the phrase, the elder to the elect. Well, the Greek word is kuria. Well, that's a word that means lady. That's what the word means. You know, we have words in English like white that mean white, but sometimes white is a person's name. Same thing is true in the Greek. Well, the word means lady. But that was also a word that was used as a name, as a proper name, curia. Maybe perhaps in the English language we would spell it, spell it C-Y-R-I-A. Well, which is it? The translator, should they say the elder to the elect lady, give the meaning of the word, or should they say the elder to the elect curia and give it as a name? There's no capital letters there to give you clues. You've got to base it on the context. And in fact, if you look at different translations in English, you'll find it both ways. Some, I think, perhaps looking at 3rd John, which is, says the elder to the elect Gaius, said, well, if 3rd John is addressed to a person, 2nd John must have been addressed to a person also. So they'll say the elder to the elect Syria. They'll put a name in. Other translators think that, well, lady is just a sort of a poetic description of the church. And they'll put the word lady, the elder to the elect lady. It's a problem. In this case, it's just not too critical. It, you know, there are two different ways of viewing it. But translating is a difficult thing. Now, maybe this is not so significant. But when it comes to this issue of the Holy Spirit, differentiating whether in the Greek text is talking about a Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit, capital letters would have helped, wouldn't they? But we don't have them. That means we have to make the discernment based on the context that's there. Now, for some of you, this may be the first time you've heard about this situation of this problem. Let me tell you, it's not a new problem. People have known about it for centuries. For example, if you have Barry's interlinear uh, Greek English New Testament, in his introduction to, the, to his interlinear text, Barry discusses this specific problem. There are not the capital letters there. And what he says is, he specifically points to this issue related to the Holy Spirit. He says, and these are quotes from his book, the greatest difficulty is touching the word spirit. Barry, in his introduction, a man of a, a great scholar who has put together this English combination, English-Greek text, he says, in some places it is very difficult to say whether the Holy Spirit as a person or the spirit lowercase s of the Christian is being referred to. He says in some cases it is really doubtful. That is, he means it's really uncertain and becomes a question for the spiritual discernment of the reader. In other words, you have to read the context and you have to make your own discernment about whether it's a passage that refers to the Holy Spirit 
or whether it's a passage that's referring to just a Holy Spirit. And he makes the comment that I've said already, and that the Greek will not help in the difficulty because in the earliest copies, every letter was a Greek letter. Let me give you some examples. Let me give you some examples of passages where some of the translations will have a capital letter. But if we kind of look at it, maybe, maybe it's not so certain that it really is the Holy Spirit. James chapter 4, verse 5, the King James Version says, Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, The spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? Lowercase s, as the King James translators have chosen their capitalization, and it's a choice that the translators make. Well, the spirit that's within us, well, we know very well God has put a human spirit within us. 1 Corinthians six twenty: glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. God gave us a body, God gave us a spirit. Uh, both of them are from God. In that context, talking about especially the spirit lusting, it, it seems like the human spirit. But notice what the New King James has. Now, I like the New King James. Most of the time, I preach from the New King James. But just notice what the translators of the New King James Version have chosen to do. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit, capital S, who? Who dwells in us yearns jealousy. The translators of the New King James evidently felt like this was a reference to the Holy Spirit. They felt so strongly about it, not only did they put a capital S on the word spirit, they actually changed the indefinite, person, indefinite pronoun there to a personal pronoun, who? That's what their, church, their choice is. Well, somebody who reads, somebody who does not know about this issue, and somebody who reads the New King James would think, well, the inspired text definitely says this is the Holy Spirit. It's not so. It's just not so. Those are two equivalent, well, except for the, the personal pronoun, those are two different translations of the, uh, of the text there. Okay, that's one part of the issue has to do with the, uh, with the capital letters. The other issue with respect to translation has to do with supplying text. Again, small words that can make a big difference. Supplying the, 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 the pronouns, the articles, A, and and the, the adjectives. Translators have to decide, in going from Greek to English many times, whether to put an A or a the. The Greek text many times does not have an article before the noun. It might say, he gave book. Well, if you translate that as he gave book, that sounds kind of crude. So to make a smooth English translation, you want to say he gave a book or he gave the book. Well, which is it? Well, there's not an article there in the Greek to decide, to tell us. So the translators have to decide whether he gave a book or whether he gave the book. That's a choice they have to make. Again, wouldn't it be nice if the Bible were written in English? It's not. So we have to deal sometimes with the choices that the translators make. Part of our study of the scripture is helping understand how it comes from Greek to English. So to make it more readable, they have to, they have to supply an adjective. And it turns out, with respect to the Holy Spirit, it is very important whether they choose to put an A or whether they choose to put a V. And when you combine these two things together, the fact that the translators have a choice in whether to say A or the, and they're making choices about whether to capitalize it or not, what in the Greek text is one item could legitimately be translated a Holy Spirit, a godly spirit, a spirit of holiness, talking about the character. Or it could just as well be translated the Holy Spirit, as if it's a re reference to the Holy Spirit as a person. So... I want us just to look at a few of these examples. Is it the Holy Spirit or is it a Holy Spirit? Situation occurs in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. In the New King James Version, it, Paul says that uh, we have demonstrated ourselves among you, and he talks about some qualities that they have. By kindness, by the Holy Spirit, by sincere love. Well, the Greek text is by kindness, by spirit holy. You notice in the Greek text the word order is different. But there's no article there. There's not an A. There's not a the. The Greek text says by kindness, by spirit holy. Well, is it the Holy Spirit? Well, a perfectly 
a legitimate equivalent translation of that word, and the EVT is not a published version. By EVT, I'm just saying that's an equivalent translation, an equivalent valid translation. Based on the words that are there in the Greek text, one could have translated that as by kindness, by a Holy Spirit, by love. Well, which is it talking about? Is it talking about by the Holy Spirit as a person or by a Holy Spirit? You see, in the context, Paul is talking about the qualities of character they demonstrated among the Corinthians by their love, by their kindness. Is it not possible that what he's talking about is is their demeanor, their spirit, their spirit of holiness, their, their sanctification as an individual. Would that not fit the context just as well, perhaps a little bit better, than the capital letters suggesting it was the Holy Spirit? Let me give you another example, Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in, the new King James says, the Holy Spirit. An equivalent translation would be the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking or righteous, but, and, but, but righteousness and peace and joy in a Holy Spirit, in a spirit of holiness. That is a, an equivalent translation based on the Greek that is there, depending on whether you choose the A or the the, and depending on whether you choose to put capital letters or not, both of those are equally equivalent. How do we decide? The context is our clue. Here, he's talking about, again, qualities of character. Perhaps, just perhaps, it's talking about having a Holy Spirit. Perhaps it's not talking about the Holy Spirit at all. One more example, Jude chapter 1, verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourself up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. That's what the New King James has. An equivalent translation is, talks about praying in a Holy Spirit. Well, which is it? When the King James translators put the the and the capital H to capital S, I'm not really sure what they had in mind about praying in the Holy Spirit. Is that some miraculous, prophetic, assisted prayer? What? I'm not sure what they meant by that. But they have suggested by their capitalization and by the inclusion of the word the, choices that they made, not the Greek text, choices that they made, they have suggested to their reading audience that it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. What if they had translated it as, the, as I put there as the equivalent valid translation, praying in a Holy Spirit? I think most readers would have gotten an entirely different impression of that passage. And again, praying in a spirit of holiness, praying with the right attitude. Is it not possible that based on the context, that's a more likely meaning of that particular phrase? One more. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 7. God hath not called us to uncleanness, but unto holiness. Talking about our holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God who has given unto us his Holy Spirit. Notice the capitalization there. The capitalization of the King James. The word holy is in a lowercase letter, and the word spirit's in an uppercase. Now, what does that mean? What are they trying to suggest there by that? Notice the last part of the next verse. Ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Well, a verse like this that says God has given you the Holy Spirit, if you see the capital H's and capital S's, you think, well, God has in some way given me the, the Holy Spirit as a person. An equivalent valid translation would be God has given us his Holy Spirit. Well, hasn't God imparted to us his spirit? I would like to say that those who know my sons would say, well, I see some of the spirit of Stan and those sons. He has given them some of his spirit, some of his energy, enthusiasm, hopefully some integrity along the way. Well, hasn't God? The good God who created us, hasn't he taken his character, showed us his character, and given his character to us? In fact, look at the last part of the verse. We are taught of God to love one another. How do we know how to love? Because God has taught us. How do we know how to be holy? Because God has taught us. If this verse had said, God has imparted to us his loving spirit, we would have understood that perfectly. 
If it had said God has imparted to us his spirit of holiness, we would have understood that perfectly. But the difference in the structure, God imparted to us his loving spirit is fine. God imparted to us his Holy Spirit because of the capitalization. People are inclined. They are led to see something entirely different in that particular passage. Context, context, context. What does it seem to be talking about? Here before this in verse 7 is something about holiness. The verse after is talking about how God teaches us. In the beginning, in the middle, it's talking about God giving us his spirit. Let the context guide us. Now, you may go away from this passage. You may say, well, Stan, I really think this is about the Holy Spirit. Fine. But make that decision based on the context. Do not make that decision based on the capital letters because they are not inspired. They are not a part of inspiration. They are part of just the judgment of the translators. But with respect to the King James, I've heard people say, well, you know, those King James scholars, they were such wonderful scholars. If it was their judgment to put a capital H and capital S on that, well, maybe I'm just willing to accept their discernment. Well, it turns out that wasn't always the case. Uh, in the early 80s when I was studying this, the new King James Bible came out and I received this little advertising document from Nelson Publishers. It had the King James Version of 1611, I mean the old King James. If you read that old King James, it sounds like Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. It's about that era. It's a very stilted sounding English. The King James that you have in your King James Bible is really a 1769 edition of the King James. It's not the 1611. It's over 150 years later. Some of the wording has been adjusted. It's, it's a bit of a 1769, a kind of a modern translation of the old King James. But if you go back and you get that 1611 translation, the one that those King James translators actually produced, here is a part of that little brochure from Romans chapter 8. Notice the spirit. I've highlighted there in yellow in, verse, in, in, in the verses that are on the screen. You don't see any capital letters there, do you? In Romans chapter 8, the capital letters were not provided by those scholarly King James translators. They, those capital letters, were an interpretation added by those who later revised that King James text. Capital letters on the spirit are an interpretation of later translators. Well, we've looked at this kind of academic issue of do we add an A or do we add a V and the capital letters. I believe that many people who have seen the Holy Spirit, capital H, capital S, I believe seeing those letters in the text has influenced their view of whether or not that passage is talking about the Holy Spirit. In fact, many people have thought that if the capital H and capital S is there, that passage must necessarily be about the Holy Spirit. But in many cases, whether it's the Holy Spirit or a Holy Spirit, is a purely a matter of the human judgment of the translators. We need to trust the context. The context is the inspired word of God. Those capital letters and sometimes the A and the V is just a, a, a human interpretation. Second item, interpret words and phrases in their, in their context. How do we determine the meaning of an English word? Well, you can look them up in an English dictionary, but English dictionaries were compiled by men. They have some of their own theology in there. You can look them up in a Greek lexicon, but those who wrote the Greek lexicons, they had their religious viewpoint also. And you can have the word studies, Vincent's or Robertson's or another, and those are good, and I use them all the time. But I have to keep in mind, they have their own theological view too. They may allow their theological view to somewhat color the definition that they give. There's another way to study what a word or a phrase means. And that is to see how that word or phrase is used elsewhere in the New Testament. And I've suggested to you at the bottom, I believe this method of Bible study is as free as possible from any form of human bias. I just take a word and I look at every place it's used in the New Testament and I read those passages and that's how I draw my conclusion about what that word means, not by some man-made document. Now, I think people will say, well, that's too hard for me. I don't speak Greek. I don't read Greek. 
It's a lot easier than you think. And I'm going to take a few minutes here just to show you how to do that. Again, I think this is something that may help uh, the word study in general. You are probably familiar with Strong's exhaustive concordance of the Bible. Strong did us a wonderful service. He took every word in the English Bible, every word in the, New, in the King James Bible, he listed them all in alphabetical order, and he gave us a list of every time that word is used. So if you're looking for baptism or baptisms or baptizing, you can find every place in the Bible where that English word occurs. Well, what Wigram and Green did, they did the same thing for the Greek words. A list of all the Greek words and how they're used. I'll tell you more about that in just a second. This is a page I think will be familiar to many of you, and that's a, it's a page out of, um, it's a section of a page out of Strong's, um, Strong's Concordance. It's the word fellowship. Well, I, I think you know how to use Strong's Concordance. Down the left-hand side are the phrases, deliver him to keep, or in the F stands for fellowship. That's the key word. There's the passage. You may have noticed on the right-hand side all those numbers. Well, and on the right hand side, those numbers, you look them up in the back of Strong's and it's a Greek dictionary. And the number refers to the word. So if you want to know what Greek word was used in or, or, of the Hebrew or the Greek in the New Testament, if you want to know what Greek word was used in Ephesians 3, 9, you go look at that number and you can see which Greek word it is. You don't have to know Greek, you just have to be able to count to about six or 7,000 and you can look them up fine. But notice, on that right-hand column down in the New Testament era, I have highlighted the ones that are 2842. It's not always that. There's a 4790. Sometimes that word fellowship in the New Testament comes from one Greek word. Sometimes it comes from a different Greek word. But I can tell, just looking right there, I can tell the passages in the New Testament that have the word fellowship when it's in the same Greek word. You see right there, all those are highlighted? I can look at all of those and I can know not only am I reading the same word in English, the word fellowship, it's based on the same Greek word. So that's easy to do. All I got to do is look for similar numbers and I know I'm looking about the same Greek word. But let me tell you how to take it one step further. That particular numbering system is also used by Wigram and Green, those guys that did the Greek lexicon. If you have a copy of that, you look up at 2842, and what they've done here is taken that one particular Greek word, koinonia, and they have listed all the places of the New Testament that Greek word occurs. And what maybe is a little bit interesting is, it's not always translated the same way, is it? In Acts chapter 2, verse 2, the koinonia is translated fellowship. But you get down to Romans 15, it's translated contribution. In 1 Corinthians 10, 6, it's translated communion. 2 Corinthians 9, 13, it's translated distribution. Well, you see this word koinonia means a joint participation together is what it means. That's what we have when we have the Lord's Supper together. We have a fellowship with one another. We have a fellowship with God. When they took up, took up a collection, there was a sharing with one another when they took it up. There was a sharing with one another when they distributed it. You see, if I look at this Greek word and I look at all the passages where it's used, look at the expanded understanding I have of this particular word. I don't limit my understanding to one particular passage. I see all the ways that it's used. This is the way you can do what I've suggested is the best way to do Bible study. Track down the Greek words you're interested in. Use this book. It'll list every time in the New Testament that Greek word is used. Every time. And you just look up those passages, and then you can learn what the Bible means when it uses that word. Extremely important. And one other suggestion is, when you find this complete list of all the ones that's been used, now, you want to look at the whole topic. When you're studying fellowship or baptism or faith or obedience, whatever it is, you want to study everything the Bible has to say about it. But if there is one particular word that you're really trying to key in on, one verb, one word in one passage, and you say, I want to know what Peter means when he uses this word, or I want to know what Paul means when he uses this word, then maybe what you want to do is you want to pay special attention to the other times that Peter has used that word in the same speech. 
The other times Peter has used that word in the same book, 1 Peter or 2 Peter. Luke wrote Luke, Luke wrote Acts. Maybe if you're trying to understand the meaning of the word in the book of Luke, look over in Acts. Maybe Luke also uses that particular word. And with that chart before, you can very easily understand which are the words that are being used by the same speaker. Words that are being used by the same narrator like, like Luke. So, although you want to take everything the Bible has on a subject, Maybe if you're trying to hone in on the meaning in a particular passage, maybe you want to give the greatest weight to that it's the same speaker on the same occasion or the same writer in the same book or the same speaker on another occasion or the same writer in another book. Let each speaker or writer define his own words. Now, is the Bible inspired? Yes, it is. Are they, is it all ultimately from God? Yes, it is. But the vocabulary is different for the different writers. If you want to know what somebody means, see how that writer uses that word. If you find it in the same book or same speech, all the better. Consider who is speaking and who do they represent. Well, when Paul says we, who is he talking about? Is he talking about we the apostles? He was an apostle. He could say we and mean that collective group. Is he talking about we the Jews? Sometimes he makes statements as a Jew. Uh, we don't want to get those confused with the other hats he may wear. We the prophets, those who had miraculous abilities. Sometimes when he says we, it's talking about all Christians. We want to be very careful to understand in that context who the we is. Otherwise, he may be making a statement that doesn't apply to all Christians of all times. For example, when Paul says, I speak by revelation and prophesying, does that mean that we should do that today? Just because he says, I do it, does that mean it's for all Christians of all times? No. We have to look at the context. Uh, if he says, Paul says, I speak in tongues, does that mean that all Christians of all ages will speak in tongues? No. Sometimes Paul says, I. Sometimes he says, we. Paul says, we prophesy. Does that we include us? No. Look at the context. It's talking about gifts that are not available today. So when you hear uh, somebody in the Bible is speaking and saying we, or they're writing and saying we, before you take that and run with that and assume that applies to you today or applies to all Christians of all time, look carefully. Make sure you're included in the context of that statement before you start applying that to you. Consider who is being spoken about and who do they represent. Well, when an audience is told, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. I'm a believer. Does that apply to me? No. I have to look at the context. Mark 16, that was John 14, verse 12. Mark 16, 17, 18. These signs will follow those who believe. They'll cast out demons, speak with new tongues, lay hands on the sick. Some verses, some groups take that out of context and say that applies to all Christians today. Well, we know better than that. But do we apply that same discipline with other passages, perhaps passages that talk about miraculous abilities? Passages that talk about Holy Spirit. We need to be careful in lifting a passage out and trying to apply it to everyone, trying to apply it to us today. John 14, 26, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance things that I've said. John 14, 26. John 16, 13. He, the Spirit of truth, will guide you into all truth. Well, who is he talking to? In those two chapters, John, the, Jesus is talking specifically to the apostles. And in those cases, maybe we can understand he is speaking only, well, some people try to apply those to us today, but it's clear he's talking just to the apostles. For example, in verse 26, he will bring to your remembrance things that I've told you. Well, Jesus is promising them that after he leaves, the Holy Spirit will remind them of things Jesus said. That doesn't apply to me. Jesus didn't say anything to me when he was here on this earth. There's nothing in that category that I need to be reminded of. These are statements that are made to the apostles. There are passages in the Bible that just do not apply to all Christians of all times. We need to very carefully separate those out, look at the context. Let me give you one more kind of detailed example here. And it turns out this is a passage that is extremely important with respect to people's views of the Holy Spirit today. Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he says, Paul says that God had established a certain group of people. 
He had anointed them. He had sealed them. He had given them a guarantee or an earnest. He says God has given those things to us. Notice what the verse says. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God who has sealed us and given us the earnest of the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Well, what is this about? Well, the first thing we need to understand is who is this being said about? Who is the us? Many people come to this and say, well, us includes everybody. Therefore, we're all given the seal and the earnest and the anointing. Well, just look at the context. Notice how carefully, notice how precisely Paul defines who us is. And notice how consistently Paul makes a distinction between the us and the you. That's a part of the audience. 2 Corinthians 1, 9, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us. Well, who is us, Paul? Well, he names it by me and Silas or Silvanus and Timothy. Paul defines who us is. If we try to take some other meaning out of this verse and define, try to apply it to another us, we have violated the context. We have violated the definition that Paul has given us of us. Preached among you by us, among you by us, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Now notice the distinction he carries on. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who has also sealed who? Not you, sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for your faith you stand. What do these verses say? Well, what they say is that Paul and Silas and Timothy were anointed and sealed and given an earnest. Now that's what it says. Now I know that some want to apply it more broadly than that, and maybe you will want to do that, maybe you'll continue to do that. But please keep in mind that the us is defined right there. Paul, Silas, and Timothy were certainly people who had miraculous abilities. Those who teach today that God gives all Christians a guarantee or, or, or an earnest, they really need to find another passage that necessarily includes every people. Now maybe you believe that God has sealed and given us an earnest and the guarantee and all of that. But to really make that point, you need to find some passage other than this one to prove that point. And, and, and maybe you think you can. Maybe you think there are others that apply. But this passage does not apply to all people of all time. Paul very specifically talks about who, who the us is, the ones that have been sealed and have the guarantee and the earnest and the anointing. Remember, a text taken from its context can become a pretext for really teaching anything. We have to be very disciplined Bible students especially when it comes to these passages that are Holy Spirit passages or some that maybe with some discipline study, some of those I mentioned earlier, may not be Holy Spirit passages at all. Last thing, very briefly, we need to consider how the original audience would have understood the meaning. Again, the things are for us. No doubt God intended us to have this inspired book for sure. But some of the things were originally spoken to a different group. They were originally written to a different group. We need to be very careful that we don't come away with understandings of a passage the original group could not have had. Now, let me acknowledge here, sometimes when we read the Old Testament, we understand very well that those people who are saying those things, they really did not understand what they were saying. They were inspired to say certain things. Psalm 22 about the crucifixion of Christ. Did David fully understand all that he was saying? I doubt it. But that's the Old Testament. We are now talking about the scriptures that were revealed after Jesus Christ came to this earth and died on the cross. This is the explanation. This is the revealing of those things who had been mysteries, that had been mysteries in times past. We are meant to understand these things. Those to whom they were written, those to whom they were spoken, were intended to understand. So if we come up with an explanation of some speech or some letter and say, well, I really believe this is what it means, but you know the Ephesians could have never understood that. <laughs> or the audience in Acts chapter 2 could never they, they would never, they would never have thought about it that way. That's a warning sign. That's a warning sign. We should be wary of interpreting anything in any way that we will readily see could not have been understood by the original audience to which it was given. 
So those are our, our areas. There are some translational issues, and I, again, it's just a fact. It was spoken in Greek and it's translated to us, and the translators were not inspired. So we have to take some time to be conscientious to understand something about the translation process. We want to keep things in their context. That scripture interprets scripture. Be careful about who is speaking and who do they represent. Who's being spoken to and who do they represent? Are the things that are said, are they really for all Christians at all times? Or are they for a more narrow group? And consider how the original audience would have understood it. How grateful we are to have God's word. And if it requires a little more effort on our part to make sure that we have the understanding of the text and not just rely solely on the translators, so be it. Is that too much for God to ask of us? Be diligent to understand God's word. This is the part of the diligence that we need to have. But in conclusion, let me just ask, if we understand it, if we have it and we understand it, if we don't do it, are we any better off than if we never got it? What about the things we understand in God's word? Somebody said, it's not the things I don't understand that bother me, it's the things that I do understand. Are there some here this morning who understand God's plan for man's salvation? That we must believe, we must believe in God, we must believe in Jesus as the Christ. We must let that knowledge of them and their love for us change our heart in repentance. Repentance, that change of mind, that change of the will. It's a change of attitude about the things that we've done in the past. It's a change in our intentions about the things we're going to do in the future. And then to be willing to confess Jesus. What is the confession in the Bible with respect to Jesus? It's not that I confess Jesus is the Lord of my life. I confess, you know, the name of Jesus. We have an example in Acts chapter 8. We're confessing who Jesus is. Who is Jesus? He is the Christ. He is the Son of God. That's the confession relative to Jesus that was made before baptism. And then the baptism, Acts 2.38, for the forgiveness of sins. 1 Peter 3.21, baptism saves us. Acts 22.16, baptism washes away our sins. This is God's plan for man's salvation. He has revealed it to us in a way that we can understand it. If you understand it, please do not delay in obeying it. And you'll have an opportunity to do that as we stand and sing. Oh, precious is the Lord.